What You Can See From Here by Mariana Lecky Translated from German by Tess Lewis Narrated by Nikki Zaycox Prologue When you stare at something that is brightly lit for a long time and then close your eyes, your inner eye sees the same thing again as a static afterimage. What had actually been light is now dark, and what had been dark appears light. If, for example, you watch a man walking down the street who repeatedly turns back to wave one last, one very last, one very, very last time, then you close your eyes. On the inside of your eyelids, you'll see the frozen movement of his very, very last wave, his frozen smile, and the man's dark hair will be light, and his light-colored eyes will be very dark. If what you were staring at was important, Selma says, something that upended the entire expanse of your life in a single movement, then its afterimage will resurface again and again. Even decades later, it will suddenly reappear, no matter what you were looking at just before you closed your eyes. The afterimage of the man waving for the very, very last time suddenly appears when, say, a mosquito flies into your eye as you're cleaning out the gutter. It appears when you briefly rest your eyes after staring for a long time at a surcharge on a bill that you don't understand. When you're sitting at the side of a child's bed to tell her a story and can't remember the princess's name or the story's happy ending because you're so very tired yourself when you close your eyes because you're kissing someone, when you're stretched out on the forest floor, on a doctor's examination table, in a strange bed, in your own, when you close your eyes because you're lifting something very heavy, when you've been running around all day and stop just to retie your loose shoelaces and with your head lowered, notice only then that you haven't stopped once the entire day. It appears when someone says, close your eyes, because they have a surprise for you. When you lean against the changing room wall because not even the very last pair of the pants you've been trying on fits. When you close your eyes just before you finally let something important slip out, such as, I love you, or, but I don't love you. When you're frying potatoes at night. When you close your eyes because there is someone at the door you absolutely don't want to let in. When you close your eyes because some great worry has suddenly lifted. You've just found someone or something you'd lost. A letter, some hope, an earring, a runaway dog, your voice, or a child who found a perfect hiding place. Again and again, this afterimage suddenly reappears this one particular image. It resurfaces like your life's screensaver, and often when you're not expecting it at all. Part One Meadow, Meadow When Selma told us she had dreamed of no copy the night before, we all knew that one of us was going to die in the next 24 hours. We were almost right. It took 29. Death arrived a bit late, and very literally. He came in through the door. Maybe he was delayed because he had put it off for a long time, even past the last possible moment. Selma had dreamed of an Okapi three times in her life, and each time, someone had then died. That's why we were convinced her dreams of an okapi were directly connected to death. That's how the mind works. It can draw connections between completely unrelated things in an instant. Coffee pots and shoelaces, for example. Or deposit bottles and fir trees. The optician had a mind especially adept in this. You could name two things that had absolutely nothing to do with each other, and right off the bat, he would explain how they were closely related. And yet, it was the optician of all people 
assuring us this latest Okapi dream most certainly would not cause anyone's death, that death and Selma's dream were completely and absolutely not connected. But we knew that the optician, like us, believed they were. The optician more than anyone. My father claimed it was complete and utter nonsense, and that our delusion came from the fact that we allowed too little of the world into our lives. He was always saying, You've got to let more of the world in. Previously, he would say this decisively and primarily to Soma. Afterward, he said it only rarely. The Okapi is an incongruous animal much more incongruous than death. It looks utterly disjointed with its zebra shanks, its taper haunches, its giraffe-like rust-red torso, its doe eyes, and mouse ears. An okapi is completely implausible, every bit as implausible, in fact, as the sinister dreams of a woman from the Westerwald. The okapi was officially discovered in Africa only 82 years ago. It's the last large mammal to be discovered by man. At least, that is the consensus. In any case, no mammal could top it. No doubt someone unofficially discovered the okapi much earlier, but at the sight of it, may have thought he was dreaming or had lost his mind, because an okapi, especially a sudden and unexpected one, looks completely invented. An okapi does not look remotely sinister. It couldn't possibly, even if it tried very hard to, which, as far as anyone knows, it rarely does. Even if crows and screech owls had been fluttering around its head in Selma's dream, to a fully sinister effect, the okapi still would have made a very mild impression. In Selma's dream, the okapi stood in a meadow near the edge of the forest, in a group of fields and meadows that together are called the Olhek, the Owl Forest. People from the Vesterwald often call things by a different or shorter name because they like to get any talking over with quickly. The Okapi in the dream looked exactly as Okapis do in real life, and Selma, too, looked exactly as she did in real life, namely like Rudy Carell. Surprisingly, we had never noticed Selma's perfect resemblance to the Dutch television host Rudy Carell. It took someone from outside to come and point it out to us years later. But then the resemblance hit us with full force. Selma's long, slender body, her posture, her eyes, her nose, her mouth and hair, from head to toe, Selma resembled Rudy Carell so perfectly that from then on, in our eyes, he was nothing more than a poor copy of Selma. In the dream, Selma and the Okapi stood in the Ulhek without moving. The Okapi turned its head to the right, toward the forest. Selma stood a few steps away. As in each of these dreams, she was wearing the very same nightgown she was sleeping in. Sometimes her nightgown was green, sometimes blue or white, but always ankle length and always flowered. Her head lowered. She looked at her toes in the grass, long and old and crooked, just like in real life. She glanced at the okapi now, and then from the corner of her eye, looked up at it from below, the way you look at someone you love far more than you're prepared to admit. Neither moved, neither made a sound. Even the wind that always blows across the Ulhek was still. Then Selma raised her head, and the Okapi turned toward her so that they were looking directly at each other. The Okapi gazed at her with eyes that were very gentle, very black, very wet, and very large. It gave Selma a friendly look, as if it wanted to ask her something, as if it were sorry that Okapis can't ask any questions even in dreams. This scene lasted a long time with the image of Selma and the Okapi looking into each other's eyes. Then the image disappeared. Selma woke up, and the dream was over.
just as some life nearby.